Genesis 10 through 17. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his power. Put on the whole armor of God so you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For our struggle is not against the enemies of the blood and the flesh, but against the rulers, against authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of the evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God so you, so you may be able to withstand on that evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Stand therefore and fasten the belt of truth around your waist and put on the breastplate of righteousness. As shoes for your feet, put on whatever will make you ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. With all of these, take the shield of faith in which you will be able to quench all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to be to God. Excellent work. Well, good morning. I greet you in the strong name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, as we gather on this first Sunday in February. Now, uh, you know, originally, uh, when we were going to put this service together, uh, Mary Price had agreed to do the prayer. But somehow God inspired her. She said, well, let me take the whole thing. So let's give Mary a hand this morning. Our youth have shown up. When God inspires youth to move on, the world is in a very good place. Now, some of you in this past week received an email from somebody reporting to be me, asking you to get several Apple gift cards. I will never ask you in an email to send any money or any gift cards to me or anybody else. That's just not who I am. What happens is somebody gets a hold of our mailing list and then they will use my name or somebody else's name uh, to kind of scam. So if you get an email from somebody saying that they are me and asking for a gift card or for money, know that it's not me Put it in the trash can as fast as you can. If the pastor is going to ask for money, it's going to be in person or in church. <laughs> the pastor may say something like, tithes and offerings are a good way, are an excellent way to express your faith in Jesus Christ, a good way to say thank you to God. That's what pastor does. And Pastor May said, you know what? We got this special project going on, and I will come straight to you in person and say, I think it may be something you want to invest in. That's what Pastor does. Pastor never asks for these things over the email. So please be careful, okay? All right. And the third thing is, not this Wednesday, but next Wednesday, Valentine's Day on the 14th, we're going to have our Ash Wednesday service here at the church at, at 7 o'clock, right? 6.30. Ash Wednesday service at 6.30 next Wednesday, not this Wednesday, the 14th, for the imposition of ashes and for communion. We invite you to come out as you celebrate with your loved one to receive ashes as we begin the Lenten season. Won't you pray with me? Lord, you are good and your mercy does endure forever. You pour out your spirit upon us and you give us a peace the world cannot offer. So come now, Lord, and have your own way. You are the potter and we are your clay. Amen. There are principalities and powers at work in the world. St. Paul had passed on to Jesus by the time the letter to the Ephesians was written. But his influence can be seen in this idea of principalities in power. When the term is used, it's used to talk about angelic forces, cosmic powers, and spheres or areas of influence. 
in the areas that these cosmic powers, these angelic forces influence are the human heart, mind, and soul. And for the most part, it's neutral, neither good nor bad. However, in Ephesians, we see that he is definitely talking about the more negative cosmic powers, the more negative forces out there that are vying for influence of our hearts, our souls, and our minds. He's talking about the powers that corrupt, the powers that speak to us. It make us afraid because when we are afraid, almost all manner of evil and bad things become possible. Other places in the Bible talk about spirit possession or demon possession because that's really what we're talking about. So how do we resist? How do we let God help us overcome these principalities and powers? that are besieging us every day. That is what comes out of this letter to the Ephesians. God, now this is it. I'm going to tell you the secret up front, okay? Spoiler alert. God has already won victory. Jesus Christ, through his obedience, has already won the victory. But we who claim Christ, we who believe, as soon as we say Christ is Lord and Savior, we are besieged by these powers and principalities who knock at our door and vie to come in to take control of heart, soul, mind, and strength. To possess, if you will, our lives. Now, what does demon possession look like? Don't think so much of the exorcist or the conjuring or the nun. You know those films? That's Hollywood. Actually, think about corruption like an iron pipe slowly getting rust on it or a boat that becomes untethered and unmoored and starts to drift with nothing to hold it in place. Think about over time how we slowly drift away from our relationship with God and Jesus Christ. Think about Adam and Eve, if you will. Think about how they chose to disobey God. They were created with free will. They had the agency to accept or reject God's directives. They walked with God in a way that none of us have ever experienced. Physically, they walked with God. God was with them, spoke to them, assured them from day to day that they were beloved and that they were created as something good out of God's caring for them. Now, we don't have in the scriptures an idea of how long it took. But we do have the story that there was this serpent in the garden where everything was just working out well. That had some conversations with Adam and Eve. And through those conversations, over time, Adam and Eve became afraid. They became afraid. They were convinced to be afraid that God was not enough. That it wasn't just enough to be in relationship with God. It wasn't enough just to trust that God loved them. They were told to be afraid that unless they became like God, they would have no security. They couldn't be whole. Something was going to be missing. So over time, through conversations, slowly, 
that conversation worked its way in. Into the hearts and minds, into the souls. Until finally they made the fearful choice. The choice to take matters into their own hands. Anytime we human beings choose to take matters into our own hands without God being there, helping to direct our hands, helping to empower our hands, helping to motivate our hearts and souls and minds, anytime we take matter into our own hands, things go caca. Messed up. Remember the economic crash in the early 2000s? We took matters into our own hands, bought homes we could not afford, got loans we should not have gotten, took these revolving interest rates. Everything was going high and mighty for a while because everybody deserves to get a house that's 3,000 to 4,000 square foot. And then things fell apart. We were afraid that unless we live the American dream, and not just the dream, but live that dream big, bold, that somehow our lives wouldn't count. Somehow we wouldn't be complete. We took matters into our own hands. There are people out there who are frightened and in order to calm down their fear, they want to take matters into their own hands. They pick up weapons, they go out and create mayhem everywhere. They take lives, rupture communities, tear apart families. In this year, 2024, in an election year, I guarantee you, somebody is going to try to make you afraid. And how they will make you afraid is they will come into your hearts, your mind, and your soul, and they will start to try to convince you that all of our problems are seated in some group somewhere. That group that speaks a language from the south of our border. If they speak French, it's okay. If they speak Spanish from Spain, it's okay. If they speak, what else is there out there? Albanian? That's okay. But if they speak Spanish from a country that south of Texas or Florida, beware. Isn't that strange? Spanish speaking in Spain is okay, but Spanish speaking from Central America, that's problematic. People will try to convince us. There are certain groups who speak certain ways with certain dialects who try to come into a certain place in a certain way are a danger to our way of life. People will try to convince us that devil worshipers come from a certain political party. You will hear things like they abuse children. They don't want you to live your life. They are actively working to bring you down. T 
to get us to see one another, to experience each other as enemy. We will see people say ridiculous things that somewhere in the back of our hearts and minds, we know it makes no sense, but we hear it so often it is said with such conviction that it starts to work its way in until we become convinced that we have to choose a side, take matters into our own hands. And instead of working for the good of all, it's working for the good of me and the good of mine. Because if we don't, those others may take away from us our life, our liberty, our way of being. And yet, and yet, the Bible is very clear. If we think flesh and blood is our problem, if we think that flesh and blood are the ones who are our enemies, there is something wrong with our thinking. Y'all hear me, right? The Bible is clear. Ephesians is clear. The problem is not one another. The issue is not the language that you speak. It's not your gender. It's not the country that you come from. It's not the neighborhood that you were raised in. It's not the school that you go to. Carolina and Duke, <laughs> Wolfpack, and those South Carolina teams, wherever they are. <laughs> it's not about who wins the Super Bowl. If you choose your side in the Super Bowl, whoever's going to go there, and you put on your jersey, you don't become the team. Because that jersey's got to come off. And when you take that jersey off, what's left behind? The thing that God created. We are God's people. We belong to nothing in this world. Though we make associations, though we may pay dues to belong to certain clubs, we are not owned by these things. They all pass away. As our bodies will one day pass away. We belong to God. In the battle that we fight, if you want to call it a battle, the struggle we are involved in, the conflict that really matters is not the conflict of person to person, but the conflict against the powers and the principalities, against the evil forces of this world, against those cosmic powers that try to misdirect, mislead, and frighten us to walk away from the God who made us, to behave as if this world is all there is. In tooth and nail, I have to fight to the end to keep what I got, even though what I got will not follow me to the grave. Why fight for something that will not stay with you and will deteriorate or fall apart? 
Why not pick up the armor of God? Why not pick up truth in righteousness? Why not pick up faith in hope? Why not pick up love and forgiveness? Why not pick up repentance and restoration? Why not pick up life in that everlasting? Because when these become the tools we use, all things become possible. Instead of tearing each other apart, we start to build up what God wants to put together. We start to co-create with God a world that reflects a glory that's not just real here and now, but will be our reality there and then on the other side of the Jordan. We fight cosmic forces, even as frail, fragile human beings. Because Jesus Christ already has what? The victory. He's already won. And by faith, like little Mary getting up here, never doing it before, being asked to pray, but says, I believe God has the victory, so let me do a little more. By faith, being terrified of what may happen, but trusting that God can make it so. Standing up, looking at you, and not letting fear win the day. That's what faith looks like. That's the battle that we fight. That's the hope that gives us the ability to become more than we thought possible. That is truth. That is righteousness. That is hope. That is life. That is, as the song says, Lord, you are good, and your mercy endureth forever. How many times have we sung that song? Do you know, Matt? Plenty. Lord, you are good, and your mercy endureth. I see Matt over here every time we sing it. That boy is bouncing. Yeah, hands in the air. Lord, you are good and your mercy endureth forever because this is how we fight the battle. With joy, with dancing, with singing, with living a life that reflects that there is something that's alive in the world. There is a power in Jesus Christ that even the stars have to bow down to. And there is a goodness in God that keeps you and me, holds us, and knows where we are, even when we are lost to ourselves. Lord, you are good. From generation to generation, we worship you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah! God is good. And we fight the battle not to win over one another. Get this. We fight the battle not to have victory over one another but to reveal that Christ has already won. You get that? Christians don't fight the win because the winning is done. 
we fight to reveal the great, obedient, faithful, enduring, holy one. Jesus Christ, who is our Lord, our Savior, from this time and forevermore. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen? Amen. amen.